Connection seems to be all around us. It's very much a theme of this conference is around connection. But I think it's one of these things that often we talk about and we think about and we think about deep connections. But what does it actually mean? And then if you think about in your counselling work, in your psychotherapeutic work with clients, um, I think I know as a psychotherapist myself that sometimes I, I have sessions with clients where I feel a really something very profound meeting happens. Um, and that there's something that happens between the two of us that feels like it's deeply transformative at some almost spiritual level in the way that we meet as people. And then there's other times when I work with a client where it feels like there's just somehow we just didn't seem to meet. But again, what is it that, that leads to one and not the other? Why is it sometimes that there's a connection and not others? Is there something about our similarities? Is it something about the level of uh, openness perhaps of the client or, 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 or my own presence in the room? And then what impact does that have on the therapeutic work? And, and, and is it important to clients? Uh, what difference does it make? So it's these kinds of questions that I'm going to talk about and that I've been exploring and researching uh, for a number of years. And, and what I wanted to present was a kind of summary of some of the things that we're finding. And I guess there is a question with re around research. You know, we sound like relational depth. Should you be taking it? Should you be measuring it? Should you be trying to uh, qu quantify it or put it into words? Because often people say that there's something about these moments of deep connection that are beyond words. In fact, one of the things we find when we ask people to talk about deep connection is, is that they often say, that's really difficult. It's difficult to describe moments of deep connection. And I guess there's a kind of a, a, a tension for those of us who are interested in um, perhaps more humanistic, more integrative elements of the therapeutic field. Because on the one hand, we can say that these things are beyond research. We don't want to cheapen it with research, I remember somebody once saying that relational depth is like this butterfly and if you try and capture it, you kind of kill it by grasping it. And we could say, you know, let's just let it be and not try and bring it together in some way, qualitative or quantitative. But I guess we also know at the same time that we live in an evidence-based culture. Uh, we live in a world where therapies are commissioned and funded on the basis of evidence. And these days, it's not enough for me to go to the government and say, look, I know relational depth is really important. I've experienced it or I've written about it. You should be funding therapies that are relational. But the reality is today that the therapies get funded are the therapies where the policymakers and the commissioners can say there is an evidence base for this. And I can kind of understand that. You know, they've got their Daily Mail on their back. Uh, they're not going to want to be saying, you know, we put this therapy in because Carl Rogers said in 1959 this was the thing to do. So, you know, there, there's an ongoing tension. And I guess for me, the, 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 the compromises that research takes has been worth it for the kind of policy impact that we've had in areas like, for instance, counselling in schools, where now hundreds of thousands of kids are getting school-based counselling based on some of the work that we've done uh, or that we've contributed to and that others have contributed to. Uh, and I guess there's also something for me more than that, though, which is about research and the ability, you know, relational depth, as I'll talk about in a minute, is about openness. It's about being, uh, allowing the world in. And what I love about research and what I've always loved about research is the way that it challenges us to think about things, to be open. Uh, and I'm not talking about a, a perspective that is research driven. But one is that research inform, one where we can use research and findings from research as a way of thinking about things mixed in with our clinical experience, our theories and our expertise. And so some of the research that we've done in relational depth, in many ways, it raises more questions than answers. But I think it's a way that has felt very fruitful and, and, and uh, productive and creative as a way of further understanding what it means to relate deeply. And of course, that doesn't take away from other areas like uh, theory, poetry, art, as other ways of understanding what it means to relate a death. But as one uh, contribution, uh, I think it has a lot of value. So let me tell you a bit about relational depth to begin with. The, co the term was coined by a colleague of mine, Dave Mearns, who many of you may know came from the person Centre Field. Uh, and he wrote Person Centre Counseling in Action. And we worked together on a book called Working at Relational Depth in Counseling and Psychotherapy. Um, now, Dave, coming from a person-centred field, had, um, I think there were two things that drove him to develop this concept of relational depth. One was that in the person-centred field, we talk about uh, training is often based around these three core conditions of 
so-called core conditions of empathy, congruence, and unconditional positive regard. And students often learn about uh, the, in their training to be empathic, and they learn and they, they learn to identify moments of empathy, moments of congruence, uh, moments of UPR. And what Dave wanted to say is that it's great to learn all these skills, but there was a lot of people, uh, particularly in the States, who were kind of codifying into different techniques these core conditions. And what Dave, I think, wanted to say is that really these, these core conditions are a one -er. they're a, they're, they're a They're a unified, integrated way of being with another person. They're not separate things. You can't do empathy now and then do congruence and then do a little bit of UPR and sprinkle a bit of UPR on. It's a, it's a way of being. And that's what he referred to as relational depth. And I think the other thing that Dave was concerned about is that as, as counselling was becoming more and more professionalised, um, he was feeling that the focus is becoming more and more on the dangers of over-involvement. And what Dave wanted to say is that there is another side of the coin, and that's the dangers of under-involvement. That's not to say we shouldn't be professional, we shouldn't have boundaries, but if the focus of our work is so much on boundaries and contracts and formalities and <laughs> being professional, there's a danger that we can lose the essence of what can be really healing in the work that we do, which is our humanity and our ability to be in a deepened connection with another human being. And so he wanted to kind of bring to the fore this, this depth of relating and remind us really that that is so important to so much of the work we do. So we worked on that first book and we worked on a, a, a book in 2018 and I did a revision of it. My, my own training is in existential psychotherapy. I trained at Regents College. So I was very interested in the work of Buba. And I guess for me, this question of what does it mean to connect with another person was always one that in my personal life had been really important to me. And I was really aware for myself of just how fundamental, how, how, how healing, uh, how valuable those moments of connection I'd had with friends or family members. They were the kind of nuggets of gold in, in, in our otherwise kind of sometimes flat, sometimes fairly low, uh, childhood that felt really uh, important and valuable to me and I was really aware that when I started uh, doing therapy that again I was experiencing something about these moments of connection and that they I couldn't quite put words onto it but somehow those moments of connection seemed to be the, the, the important parts of what I was doing in therapy. And I was very taken by Buber's work, the work of the existential philosopher Martin Buber, when he talks about the I thou stance then he talks about dialogue. Um, and he, Buber differentiates between dialogue and, and what he calls uh, monologue, disguised as dialogue, where it looks like people are talking, but actually they're really talking to themselves, uh, or monologue per se. And it raised for me again those questions about what's the difference between monologue and dialogue? How do we define dialogue? How do we understand what it means to be truly in dialogue with another person? Because I can feel it, you know, I have a bodied sense when I'm in dialogue with someone as opposed to, for instance, someone talking at me or someone not listening. But what does it actually mean? As I said, we've, done, we've had a lot of work and research around relational depth. So we had <coughs> a book came out recently called uh, Research in uh, Relational Depth, which was new perspectives on it. Uh, and, and that has a number of chapters, for instance, relational depth with children uh, and some of the criticisms of relational depth. We define relational depth as a state of profound contacts and engagement between two people, where each person is fully real with the other and able to understand and value the other's experience at a high level. So relational depth, as I was saying, was something about being uh, real uh, and was also something about valuing the other and was also something about understanding the other. So we brought in all those core conditions. But one of the questions we had is, is, like, is relational depth is it something about a quality of a relationship? Do you have like a, a deep relationship or is relational depth more of a moment? And actually, Dave and I, when we were working on this book, did come at this from slightly different perspectives. Dave was particularly interested in the kind of deep relationship. I think from my phenomenological background, I've been particularly interested in these moments of deep connection and what happened at these very deep moments. I guess one way we conceptualised it, if you, can you see the, this screen all right, by the way? It's a bit right, it's okay. Yeah. Um, so one of the ways that we conceptualised it was to think that the, the level of connection in any relationship can kind of go up and down and that there's moments of deeper connection and there's moments of perhaps less deep connection. And that when we're talking about relational depth, what we're talking about is we're talking about those moments when the connection really deepens 
And those, those particular moments where it feels like a really profound, strong, uh, low down uh, connection with the other. Uh, but that raises questions in itself. For instance, are those moments, are they qualitatively different from the other moments? Is it like we kind of quantitatively go up and down? It's like a smooth transition. We can have more or less contact. Uh, or is it that there's something about those moments that are really profound uh, and that are different from other experiences in everyday life? But we can kind of differentiate between maybe deep relationships where there is more of that depth of connection and then more su surface level relationships where we don't have so much deepened connection. So uh, a deepened relationship is one where there's more moments of relational depth uh, compared with a surface level relationship. But again, it throws up some interesting questions. Can you have uh, a relationship at depth with someone where maybe there's only been one <coughs> moment of deep connection or perhaps no moments at all? Could you, have a, could, you, could you have a deep, you know, if you think about the people in your life that you have a deep, uh, you feel a deep relationship with, how much do those moments of deep connection happen? Maybe they're in a different country. I have friends that um, I haven't seen for many years, and yet I feel a deep connection to them based on perhaps one or two or more moments of deep connection earlier on uh, in our friendship. Of course, relational depth doesn't just come from the person-centered field. There's people in other areas that have talked about it. As I was saying, there's boobers, talked about the I-thou stance. Uh, Daniel Stern from the more psychodynamic field has talked about moments of meeting. Judith Jordan, the feminist uh, cultural therapist, has talked about mutual intersubjectivity. Ronnie Lang talks about co-presence. John Rowan, who unfortunately died uh, last year, uh, talks about linking from a kind of transpersonal perspective and the idea that when we kind of link at a soul-to-soul -soul level, that we're talking about something very similar. And actually, um, uh, Buba, who him also comes from a spiritual background, talks about these moments of relational depth or moments of I-thou meeting or dialogue as the way towards spirituality. For him, that we actualize our spirituality, not away from other people, not from doing things necessarily like mindfulness or, or, or being separate, but that it's in those moments of deep connections with others that we find our way to, towards something transcendent, that to be in spiritual connection is to be through uh, bonds with others and through bonds with our community. So, what have we learned about relational depth? Well, one of the first things that we've looked at is this question of what is the experience of relational depth actually like? What's the phenomenological experience of deep connection. Just to say, these slides will be available from the middle of next week on the uh, oh, well. conference website. So, what, is that, what's it, what does it feel like phenomenologically to connect deeply with another person? And we've done studies with clients, we started off doing studies with therapists, and there's been a number of these studies now, several studies looking at this question. And we tend to find that this experience of relational depth falls into four areas. So one is the kind of intrapersonal feelings, what I feel inside. And then there's the experience of the other, so how I experience the other at those times. There's something about the relational, what goes on between us, and then a fourth thing about the atmosphere. In terms of the intrapersonal, people talk about feeling very authentic, that there's something about a moment of deep connection, you feel very real, you just feel like you're being yourself. There's an energy about it, there's a kind of exhilaration and empowerment and aliveness at these moments. People often describe it as a very physical thing. They kind of feel it in their body and, and very importantly what we've learned is that relational depth is not just the kind of cognitive head-to-head -head connection. It's a very much uh, embodied uh, physical, people talk about feeling electrified or tingly, like something goes on in their bodies that, that mean that they're in resonance. And we know now from some of the um, neuroscientific evidence that, that, that this indeed can happen, that, all, that we can resonate through mirror neurons with others, uh, so that, for instance, with our clients, we can pick up in a, an embodied level uh, what goes on with them in a way that is sometimes deeper and more holistic than what we might know at a cognitive level. People talk about it as being very spontaneous and in the moment. There's a sense of immersion. A lot of people talk about feeling very immersed in this moment. It's like they're very focused. One counsellor I remember saying that she worked in this very noisy room. But when she was in a deep connection with her client, she wasn't aware of the noise anymore. It was just like her and that client there in the room together, uh, free of distractions. People talk about feeling very safe and okay with themselves. There's a sense of kind of self-worth. Although also people often say that 
coming in or associated with these moments of relational depth is a vulnerability. Uh, it's like you kind of open yourselves up, and that's the vulnerable bit. When you're in there, it doesn't feel so vulnerable, but the opening up can be uh, feelings of vulnerability. And often clients talk about these moments as moments of kind of insight, and in fact, it's often difficult to disentangle, uh, where, particularly when we look at the effects. What is the effects of that moments of connection, and what is the effect of the moments of insight? It's like in Jenlin's terms, in focusing terms, it's like where people are right at the edges of their awareness and that they're bringing something new into, uh, experiencing into awareness in connection with others. Relational depth seems to be very much about being in connection with myself, but in connection with another person. It's not just an internal experience, it's a kind of shared experience of internal and external. As something new emerges that you don't tend to get these moments when people are talking about rehearsed things that they're very familiar with. Um, it's something new at the edges of people's being. And then people talk about how they experience the other. They, they feel at these moments that the other is very genuine. Um, Dave used to say that at the moments of relational depth uh, that there's no transference. That clients just experience us as we are, not as a, uh, as a projected uh, figure. I had somebody ask me recently, actually, whether uh, if you had project, if there was transference, could you have a relational depth if the client was transferring onto the therapist, say, a parent figure or not? And it was quite an interesting question that I don't really know the answer to, but I think there's something about if the therapist is holding that projection but also is feeling themselves and is engaging in a way that is authentic, I think you can have a lot of depth. I think if the, client, if the therapist was just neutral and was just holding the projection without being themselves present, um, that I don't think that would be so much relational depth. And it does also then raise the question about, can you have relational depth one way? Can one person experience relational depth with another, but the other not experience it back? And I'll come on to that. We've done some research around that. So people feel that the other is very understanding at these moments, and trustworthy comes up a lot. There's a real sense of deep trust for the other, and being valued and acknowledged. And then people talk about the connection in different ways. They talk about a kind of closeness, an intimacy, a togetherness. They talk about an encounter and meeting of minds. Um, they talk about how they're kind of flowing together, a synchronicity often comes up, and a mutuality and equality. Clients often say that at these moments, they, 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 know, they know that the psychotherapist is, is still other and still a professional, but they don't experience them as a kind of white-coated professional who, who, who's the one who knows. It's just them and that person in the room together. And they really, at those moments, talk about this humanity of the psychotherapist rather than them in their professional role. Um, there's a sense of bi-directionality and a kind of interconnectedness, like it's not just that the therapist feels that they know the client, but they feel that they know the client knows them and clients talk about something similar. And sometimes people talk about love and the way that, you know, in the same way that in, in therapy we can have that experience of not, obviously not romantic love, but a kind of filial, what we might call love, that relational depth seems to have some connection with that. Sometimes people also talk about a kind of blending and at oneness, and that's another area of discussion. You know, is relational depth where we're one together? Because Buber would say that to have dialogue, you have to have difference. It can't be, you know, if you're the same as somebody, and, and this, this kind of brings up differences with Rogers in some way, because Rogers talks about standing in the shoes of the other. But Buber, and Buber was in dialogue with Rogers, says that uh, when we're in dialogue with another, there needs to be an otherness. If we're just in the shoes of another person, we can't really talk to them that relational depth is maybe more talking across differences. And then there's something about the atmosphere. People often talk about a kind of sense of timelessness at these moments. It's like short periods feel very long or long periods feel very short, particularly in therapy. But a stillness, so there's a kind of energy, but also stillness. People talk about it as an altered or a kind of magical state, and again, spirituality comes up a lot. For me, the best way of understanding these moments of relation that is, is what I call a kind of co-presence. So uh, James Bugenthal, the existential humanistic therapist, talks about presence as having two aspects. He talks about it as it having a receptivity, that to be present to another means to really take that unique person in. So if we're working, for instance, with someone who's depressed, uh, not just thinking, okay, here's a depressive or here's a borderline, I know all about borderline people, but to really listen and, and to take in, to breathe in the uniqueness of that person. And then out of that comes an expressivity that we share from that understanding of the other 
from, from that taking in at, at that embodied again level that we express something of who we are. But relational depth is not just what one person does. And of course, um, you know, as therapists, we can't make relational depth happen. We can at best perhaps facilitate its emergence. And one of the reasons for that is because, as we saw before, people said that relational depth is something spontaneous. You can't construct it. But another reason is that relational depth is not just about us. The client is a key part of that. And to have relational depth, the client also needs to be receptive of us and expressive of us. And often that's the key challenge. You know, we can work on our own uh, receptivity, our listening, our ability to listen, our ability to re resonate deeply at an embodied level. We can work on our own uh, self-awareness so that we can be more expressive. But we can't work on the client's receptivity or expressivity. And often if we're working with clients who've been maybe traumatized, abused, deeply hurt, then being receptive to another is an incredibly challenging thing to do. And I'm sure we've all worked with clients where you know, we feel that it's really difficult for that other person to take us in, and probably for very good reasons. Uh, but without that person taking us in, being able to hear us, being able to uh, take in some of the things we're maybe sharing, and often positive things. You know, I've worked with clients where the things that they were most close to was the positive feedback that I was giving them, that they weren't a bad person or that they weren't useless at everything. Um, but there was something really shut there in terms of that receptivity and we talked about that and of course it was because their experience has been that when people have been positive to them they then manipulated and then used that. And clients also need to be expressive in terms of being able to talk about uh, what's going on for them at a deep level and again I'm sure you've had experience working with clients where the talk very much seems to come uh, from the outside. Uh, you know, what they did over the day or what their partners did, but rather than something deeply felt. So as psychotherapists, the, the challenge for us in some ways to meet clients at depth is, is four different doors that need to be open. We need to be receptive to clients. We need to be able to express ourselves, but also clients need to be receptive and expressive. And often that's something that just simply takes time in the relationship to emerge. Um, so... What else have we learned about relational depth? Well, in terms of understanding more about relational depth, we found different ways of measuring it. And as I said before, you know, there's challenges around measuring relational depth and kind of cheapening it, if you like. But at the same time, it does allow us to explore it, understand more, be able to talk about it, and ultimately be able to see whether it is related to therapeutic outcomes. Um, one of the measures we developed is something called the relational depth inventory. And this invites clients to think about a specific moment in therapy, to think about a specific moment in therapy, and then to rate it on qualities that we know are associated with relational depth, like I felt a sense of freedom, or I felt my therapist had respected me. Something that we've been doing more recently, and we've been doing a lot of work on, is something called the relational depth frequency scale. The relational depth inventory has been really interesting, but it does focus on just one specific moment in therapy. So it doesn't kind of capture relational depth in the relationship as a whole. So the relational depth frequency scale, what that does is that that asks clients or therapists to think back on the relationship and then think how frequently they experience things like, I, I felt we were deeply connected to one another, and they can mark that from not at all uh, to most or all of the time. And then we can look uh, at how much clients are experiencing relational depth in therapy, how much therapists are experiencing. But then we can also look at, is that experiencing a relational depth related to therapeutic outcomes? Or is it that clients who are experiencing more depth then have better outcomes? And I'll, I'll tell you some of the things we're finding uh, later on in the talk. But the first question we looked at really was, do therapists experience relational depth for their clients? And I did an interview study with a number of person-centered therapists. And there's been surveys and other studies since. What our quantitative evidence shows is that most therapists do recognise experiences of relational depth. So on our uh, th relational depth frequency scale, the frequency is sometimes, somewhere between sometimes and often. So they're not saying that they always experience it with clients, but to a certain extent. Um, where we've done interview studies, we also find that most person-centered therapists, for instance, that I talk to, could identify moments where they felt very deeply connected to their clients. Uh, other interesting studies, for instance, Eleanor McLeod looked at therapists working with clients with learning disabilities and found that also there, 
most of the therapists could identify times of deep connection, which was interesting because uh, the literature has often said that people with learning disabilities can't really connect, you want to work in more cognitive behavioural ways, but she found that the therapists could really talk about powerful moments of deep connection with their clients. And we've since done studies with other therapists, therapists working with young people for instance, and again there seems to be that experience of connection. Some of the moderators, we found that uh, more experienced therapists seem to experience more relational depth. And also that therapists talk about more relational depth in longer, longer episodes of therapy. So relational depth, it, it does seem to happen uh, where uh, it's shorter episodes, but it doesn't happen as much. And the longer the therapy goes on, the more frequently people seem to experience these moments of relational depth. But we didn't find any gender orientation or age differences. Another question, though, and perhaps a more important question, is do clients experience relational depth? You know, is relational depth just something that therapists feel? And actually, for clients, it's not really so relevant or experienced. So again, we've got both quantitative and some qualitative evidence of this. Quantitatively, we found that around four-fifths of clients could uh, identify moments of deep connection in their therapy. Although, um, interestingly, a lot said that they'd met therapists and didn't feel any connection and eventually found someone that they could connect with. In terms of frequency, it's a bit less than the therapist. So therapists were somewhere between... Oh, shit. <laughs> uh, what was that? That is not feeling a relational depth, is it? I know what's wrong. All right. Power cable came out. Let's see what's going to happen here. This is where... It's Spiritual deep connection with my computer. Let's have a look. Um, suddenly, this is where relational depth doesn't matter at all. I just need a technical intervention. No, I think it's okay. It's going to come back on. Yeah, it's just the power. That's fine. So, <laughs> so just on this question, sorry, I'll, do we press that? Come on, come on, come on, come on. So I'll just carry on without the slides, just while we're trying to get the slides, just because I don't want to eat into your time. So just on, I can see it here. I might turn my rap, laptop around and so you can see it as well. We got it? No. So just in terms of what clients are saying about their experiences of uh, relational depth, um, around four-fifths of clients say that they do have, that they have had some experience of deep connection with their therapist, uh, although they do report it a bit less than the therapist. And in terms of uh, qualitative findings, uh, again, what we found when we've done interview studies with clients, and that's been some of the most interesting studies, is talking to clients about their own experiences of deep connection and what that means to them. But we found that most participants could identify moments of deep connection. Um, and for instance, participants in cognitive analytic therapy could identify moments of deep connection. But as I was saying, many clients found that they had had these relationships where they hadn't had so much of a deep connection. Now, one of the interesting things that we looked at was um, looking at what happens when you do video conference-based therapies. Do clients experience deep connections in uh, online therapies? And um, actually, what we found is that most clients could identify these moments of deep connection. Around five out of seven, I mean, it was just a small-scale study, but around five out of seven clients uh, talked about having had these experiences of deep connection. And what was interesting is that they talked about what you might imagine as kind of inhibiting factors like a sense of physical detachment um, and a lack of nonverbal cues, uh, technical difficulties, feeling distracted. But... <laughs> <laughs> feeling distracted. But also what they talked about was that they talked about that there were some positive things around uh, web-based therapies. So that they actually, what they said is that the kind of physical distance from their therapist meant that they um, 
uh, that they felt more anonymized and then they felt that they could talk about more things that maybe they wouldn't have been able to talk about otherwise because that there was that kind of freeing up because it was based on the web. For instance, one client said, I felt quite like relaxed and very free to express what I might want to be being on Skype rather than being face to face. So it seemed like it worked both ways. And uh, I think on email therapies, even therapies based on emails, I wouldn't be surprised if clients were saying that actually that they could experience quite a depth of connection, um, even though it wasn't the kind of face-to-face. -face. They lost the face-to-face, -face, but they had some other things. Um, do you want to, sorry, could you put it on duplicate? Sorry? Uh, so I'll leave you to it. Is that brilliant? Apologies for that. Okay, so on on the web-based, um, yeah. So on uh, on on web-based therapies, people also talked about um, experiences. Oh damn! I'm just going to stand here and bang this. Sorry, this doesn't normally. Yeah, brilliant. So, now another one we looked at was about young people's experiences. And we'd had a paper in, our, in the book that I showed you before, which was around um, a, a therapist who worked with young people, saying about how she'd experienced uh, very deep connections with young people. But another question that was to see it the other way around, what about young people? Do they experience connection with therapists? And what we found interestingly is that the young people really struggled uh, to identify moments of deep connection. And of course, we didn't ask them, you know, tell us about a time of relational depth with your therapist is defined in this. We said, you know, can you tell us about a time of closeness or connection with your therapist? And what seemed to happen is that they, they really didn't, they didn't, just didn't get the question really about closeness and connection. We thought about, you know, is that that they just don't experience it? And maybe it's just therapists are imagining it. Is it that young people don't have the language to talk about closeness and connection? Uh, in a way that adults do, and maybe that it's not kind of how they conceptualise things. Um, is it that they don't see the therapist as someone that they would connect with? Like, it's a bit of a weird question to say, you know, do you connect with this person when you see a counsellor in a school as kind of miss and, and not someone you connect with? So that they were quite thrown by that question. Um, so it'd be interesting, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean they didn't experience it, but it would be interesting to look more into that. In terms of moderators, what we found is that um, we looked at the, uh, across different orientations. In humanistic person-centered therapies, tends to be quite a lot of connection as clients rate it. Uh, in some of our studies, we found that there was less in psychodynamic approaches. Others have um, kind of shown mixed findings. We haven't found massive differences. In, although some people might think that in CBT, you would have less of a connection. Actually, that hasn't come up. Uh, and some studies, actually, there was a very interesting study about factors that have caused uh, a deepening or a strengthening of the alliance. And interestingly, when clients were rating these different factors, one of the ones that they highlighted most strongly were um, things like being asked to do homework, uh, setting goals with the therapist, uh, doing exercise. It was, it was the technical factors, actually, rather than things like self-disclosure, uh, the counsellor really understood me. And there might be something about where you're doing these quite technical things that are kind of working together, can actually feel very connecting. And equally, and I think this is particularly pertinent to person-centred therapy, that sometimes sitting opposite someone who's not really saying much, even if that therapist is trying for themselves to really deeply connect, can actually for clients feel very disconnecting. And we see that a lot in our, uh, the research we've done around uh, counselling in schools, where kids again and again and again and again say, I can't stand it when the counsellor doesn't say anything. You know, I feel really awkward. It's like I'm sitting there and she's just looking at me. One young person I was looking at recently said, you know, she looked at me for three minutes and just didn't say anything. Like, what is this weirdness going on? Um, <laughs> And I think that's something really important to take on board. I'm sure the counsellor was thinking, I'm really trying to understand you, I want to create a space for you. But for the client, it felt really disconnecting. We've done some work around um, gender. Uh, one study, we found that the connections were generally deeper with female therapists as compared with male therapists. But what was particularly interesting was that, that was, the difference was bigger with male clients. So that when you had a male client working with a female therapist, that's where we got the deepest connection. 
uh, and then a uh, male client working with male therapists, you had the less, least connection and the differences were a bit smaller when the, uh, 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 the therapist, were, sorry, when the client was a female. Another interesting question we've been looking at is around whether client and therapist actually experience deep connections at the same time. So is it that, for instance, as I said before, you know, is it that the therapist experience might be this kind of up and down of connection, but is the client's one similar? Is it a similar journey? Or could it actually be that at times when the therapist isn't feeling much connection, the, connect, the client is really feeling connection, and when, when the uh, uh, therapist is feeling the deepest connection, the client is thinking about what they're going to have for their supper or um, you know, <laughs> what bus they're going to get home. So we did a study around this, and what we did is that we asked, we did like counselling pairs, and we gave people a little grid, and every minute we asked them to just mark down separately, so they couldn't see what the other one was doing, um, how deeply connected they felt. So you might look at that and you think, that is just the worst kind of research, like how is anybody going to experience relational depth when they're having to write down on a little grid, I feel 7 out of 10 relational depth. But, it wasn't too bad, actually. People felt that they got used to it, and it was interesting to then see what the matching. Um, and what we found, actually, I was quite surprised by this, but what we found is actually the matching wasn't too bad. It was about 50% uh, overlap. And we found a number of instances where the therapist and the client really kind of followed the same track in terms of how deeply connected they were, that as one went up, the other went up, and one went down, the other went down. But we did find other examples, for instance, here, where what you've got is a therapist who starts off feeling pretty deeply connected to the client, and that carries on at about the same level all the way through therapy. And at the, in the meantime, you've got a client who's starting off the same therapy, so they're sitting opposite each other, but the client is starting off feeling really just not connected to this person who actually does feel a connection back to them. And then they go on this journey of deepening and deepening and deepening connection. Um, whereas the therapist pretty much stays at the same level. Interestingly, we found that when the therapist was a, uh, a, a qualified counsellor psychotherapist, as a, compared with a trainee, that they, there wasn't higher matching with the client. But again, we found that the women were more matched with, as well as having deeper overall, that the women were more matched than the uh, uh, men. So... Another question that this kind of brings us on to then is what about the impact? Does any of this matter? Does relational depth actually have any influence on what happens in therapy and therapeutic outcomes? And we've looked at that now in a couple of ways. Um, we, um, one of the things we've done is that we've used this relational depth inventory um, which asks clients to identify a particular helpful moment in therapy and then we can rate that and we can look at how deep the connection was in that particular moment. And then we can look at whether it correlates with the therapeutic outcomes. And what we found is actually that there is a pretty strong correlation. And bear in mind that that's just one moment in therapy. So what that means is that clients, when you ask them to think about a helpful moment, the clients who are identifying moments when there was a deeper connection seem to have better outcomes overall. And of course, it's correlation. It doesn't prove that one leads to the other. But it is quite striking because we're just talking about one moment. And you can see here, that's the degree of relational depth and that's the outcomes, higher up being better, and that you find a general correlation. Oh, just on the train up, I was looking at some data from our, we have a research clinic at uh, University of Roehampton. And I was looking at our data there. Now, this is slightly different because one of the problems with looking at just the quality of the relationship and outcomes is that you don't really know which one is causing which. You know, it might be that you get a better relationship on moments of relational depth, and then that, that leads to better outcomes. Or it might be that clients, you know, have good outcomes, they're feeling good about the therapy, and then you ask them how they feel about the therapist, and they go, yeah, what a great therapist, I really like them. So, you know, there's always this thing about which way round does it go, and we have to be very cautious in interpreting the findings. One of the things that people do then is that rather than looking at therapy from the beginning of, and to the end, what you can do is you can measure, say, the depth of relating at session four, and then rather than looking at the change overall, you can look at the change after that point. And if you're getting a correlation between the depth of relating at session four and then change after that, that does start to suggest more that one is proceeding and perhaps causing the other. And this is just some data I looked at last night, and that shows that very much, that this is the ratings on that relational depth frequency scale, which goes from 6 to 30. 
And this is the client's outcomes on the PHQ-9, which is a measure of depression. And again, what you can see is a correlation. It's only a small number of clients, but it's quite a strong correlation. I mean, it's not 100% not overlap. It's about 13% overlap, but that's still quite a strong figure for psychotherapy research, showing that as, cli as clients rate more depth in the relationship, so the outcomes become better. And in fact, when I looked at the therapist, it's something similar. Sometimes the therapist ratings don't count, don't correlate with much, but actually the therapist ratings also uh, predicted better outcomes. That's similar to what we've seen also in quality of interviews, that when we talk to clients, what they say is that these moments of connection do have a highly significant and enduring positive effect, both on the therapeutic process and long after. And in terms of the immediate effects, what they talk about is these moments being facilitative, healing, changing, and they talk particularly about the way that it deepens trust with their therapist. Um, that although they're not always at those moments of deep connection, they feel that they can go back to them, and it allows them to uh, feel that they can have deep connections with their therapist in future. In terms of long-term effect, the main thing that clients talk about is about an increased connection to their own selves. Uh, and they say that these moments of deep connection allow them to connect back to themselves. And they also talk about feeling more powerful and able and improve relationships with others. So in some ways what we can say is that this relational connection, this, this, this meeting between the client and the therapist, allows the client to transform how they relate to themselves, that maybe from a place of shame, a uh, place of vulnerability, that the therapist connecting with that in a way that is empathic, accepting, real, but all those things together in a way that is deeply supportive and, and, and loving allows the client to transform and internalize and transform that relationship to themselves. So I'm just going to skip a few things because I wanted to come on to uh, just about a final very important question, which is about what is it that therapists can do then to um, deepen their connection with clients? What facilitates a relationship? Oh, sorry. I'm not doing very well on PowerPoint today. Death by PowerPoint. They say, I'm dying. They normally talk about the audience dying. This is me dying. Self-death by PowerPoint. <laughs> if you can have that. Um, so one of the things, and I think, again, you know, what I love about research is that it helps you talk to clients and I do one of my one of the things I bang on about sorry about this but often when people do research in psychotherapy particularly a master's or doctorate you know they look at what therapists think about this what therapists think about that and I just feel we're missing such a trick by not talking to clients and hearing from the horse's mouth so to speak about what do clients actually experience and how do clients find things so one of the things we've done is to talk to clients and Roseanne Knox particularly did this about what do clients feel led to those moments of deep connection? And the thing that comes up, I think the most interesting thing that comes up is that clients talk about genuine care. They, what they say is that what really mattered is that I felt the therapist cared about me. And in a way, that's more than just acceptance or non-judgmental. It's more than just somebody saying, you know, you can be however you are, it doesn't matter how you are. It's feeling like someone is on your side. And clients talked about this in the kind of little things. It was like, uh, one that comes up a lot is clients saying, I was in hospital and a therapist came to visit me in hospital and we did some work there. Or the client saying, it was raining and the therapist offered me an umbrella. Um, or, or that they shook my hand or that they were warm and, and, and welcoming and that they gave me a few more minutes in the session because I was really upset. It was where the therapist conveyed that they weren't just doing a job but they actually felt it, it mattered to them what happened to the client. And I think that goes right back to what I was saying at the beginning about where Dave was coming from, about the dangers of under-involvement. Uh, clients didn't want unprofessionalism. They didn't want you know, therapists ringing them up at 8 o'clock at night and inviting them out for a drink. Um, but it was, it was feeling that that they mattered. And I, and I think what that means for us as therapists is not, you know, you can't make mattering. But I know that most of the, all the clients I've worked with, that there is a deep sense of care that I have towards them. And what I've learned from this research is the value of being able to express that. And uh, through expressing that, five minutes, is that okay? Thanks. Um, 
that, by, that it's okay and often very helpful to express that. It doesn't always have to be held back. And obviously, you know, there's, there's professional issues and boundaries. All these things are very important. But there is also an important space for care in the relationship. And being, being on the th client side uh, was about feeling like, um, you know, that the therapist had your back, that they wanted the best for you. That, you know, it wasn't about somebody saying, yeah, God, your husband, what a bastard, you know, you really should have left him. But it, was, it wasn't about collusion, but it was about feeling, again, somebody, it mattered, and that you really wanted your best for the, for the client. There's been some interesting work in super, uh, on super shrinks, and I, I think, again, that comes up in that literature, that these super shrinks, who do seem to have uh, better results than others, that they have this real passion for the work and for the client. Uh, in terms of doing what they can to make things better, rather than a more neutral, detached, disinterested, or, you know, not, not that they are disinterested, but, but coming across sometimes as disinterested. Compassion is, a, is another way, perhaps, of expressing that linking to compassion focused therapy. So, clients thought, talked about the warmth of the therapist, about being really real, not playing the role of a psychotherapist, but being just themselves uh, was important for clients, open, safe. One client said, it felt as though my counsel without breaching boundaries went beyond a professional level interest and gave me such a human, compassionate response, something I couldn't put a price on. I think I'd only expected to receive from her professional self. It felt like she was giving from her core. Um, clients also said, though, that, you know, that, that, that it was also about them and it was about them knowing what they wanted from therapy, that they talked about having thought about what kind of therapist they want, being ready to engage, and then clients talked about kind of making a leap, and that, that relates to that thing I was saying about the kind of, uh, the client's own receptivity and expressivity, that for therapists it often felt spontaneous. Clients were saying, right, I opened those doors, and that, uh, that's really what allowed that relational depth to be happen. One client said, it was a very definite thing within myself that happened, that I allowed myself to be so open and let my defences down enough. It was almost as if I got to the point of no return and I thought, I'm going to go for it. Just the last thing I want to say, and then I'm sorry about eating into your break time, but um, I think another way of looking at this is, you know, how might we as therapists be more open to meeting clients of relational depth? And that means inviting ourselves at a level of self-reflexivity to really think, what are the ways in which I stop connecting with other people? Um, Judith Jordan, the feminist therapist, has talked about this idea of strategies of disconnection. The idea that we all have ways that we have learned to break away from connection from others because we feel vulnerable, because we feel scared. And you know, if we're ourselves with our clients, then that's something that will inevitably uh, come into our client work. Maybe we sometimes deal with uh, fears of disconnection by becoming detached, or we have ways of disconnecting which are about intellectualizing. You know, and, and by looking at our own relationships and our own relationship to intimacy and connection and thinking about how do I break connection with people in my lives when I know that actually I could be more connected. Do I put on a kind of facade? Do I go very quiet? Do I withdraw? Um, do I talk about theory? And by thinking about that in our own lives, in our own therapy and in supervision, we can maybe then think, uh, you know, does that ever come into our therapy? Or if not, what comes into our therapy? That means that sometimes we don't allow ourselves to connect with our clients as much as we could. And of course, you know, it's not that those things are bad or wrong, but by reflecting on it and becoming more aware of it, we can maybe learn to put it more to one side and more fully meet our clients and allow that connection to be there with clients when they can. I know for myself, like, I'm quite a conflict avoidant person. And I know sometimes with clients that where they're maybe a bit angry or a bit irritated, a bit annoyed, I can tend to just deflect it a little bit rather than actually staying there and meeting it uh, and encountering it. And sometimes that actually, although things are nicer, it can sometimes make the work a little bit more superficial. So something to think about, and I hope that's um, introduced you to some of the work we've done. And as I say, you know, you know, I think what I love about this work is that it's raised so many questions, and I think, you know, so many interesting questions. And even though there aren't easy answers, even though it's murky and unclear and, and lost, I, th I think in a way when we're talking about relationships and connection, we probably wouldn't want anything else. And it's really a lifetime exploration. So thank you very much for listening.